All right. Hello, everyone. We see that some of you are still connecting to your audio. So we're going to just hang out for a little while, a couple more minutes while people still filter in from the lobby. So just hang out with us and then we'll be, we will get started in a little bit. And while we're here waiting for people to file in, feel free to use the chat box um, to introduce yourselves and where you're tuning in from. So far, we see a couple of people from St. Augustine, uh, Nocatee, awesome. Jacksonville, awesome, awesome. And some fellow supportive GTM staff. So at this point, we have about half of the number we had signed up. So we will give people a little, a little bit more time to file in um, and to connect to their audio. So if you're just now joining us, we are just hanging out, letting people file in and get connected. Um, and feel free to use the chat box to introduce yourselves and where you're tuning in from. Lots of St. Augustine folks, a couple of Palm Coast in Jacksonville. Welcome, welcome. All right, Jacksonville, Palm Coast, St. Augustine, welcome, welcome. So I think we will get started. Um, my name is Madison Skidmore. My colleague Brit Brittany Wessick and I, we will be helping host this series today. Um, Brittany, if you don't mind while I get started to just keep an eye on the lobby and we'll keep people filing in while we get started. All righty. Welcome everyone. This is our GTM Talks for April. My name is Madison Skidmore. My colleague Brittany Wessick and I will be hosting this series. Feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat box. Let us know where you're tuning in from. GTM Talks is a virtual lecture series that highlights research and monitoring efforts at the reserve. Each lecture within the series will focus on one of the reserve's management plan goals, which are to improve natural biodiversity, improve water quality, enhance understanding of sea level rise and climate change impacts, improve visitor experiences while minimizing resource damage, and increase awareness of cultural history. Today's lecture will highlight several of these management goals, as well as the scientific methods used to understand the behaviors of threatened and endangered sea turtles of the, of the areas here, 
and the diligent volunteerism that enables the prosperity of these projects. And now I'll pass it over to Brittany for Zoom housekeeping. Hello everyone. So as Madison said, my name is Brittany Wusick. Um, I am the public outreach coordinator at GTM Research Reserve. And I am going to run through some Zoom controls and housekeeping. So um, as you enjoy today's presentation, if you could please make sure that you keep your microphone muted throughout the time just to make sure we have clear audio. Um, it's up to you if you wanna have your video on or off. Uh, and then as you can see to the right of the video option on your panel, um, you'll see a chat box option and that will allow you to ask questions throughout the presentation. And um, dependent on that, we do have time at the end of the presentation for questions and, ans and answers, but um, for also verbal questions as well. And there also is, we'd like to invite you guys to use the reactions um, function too throughout the presentation, which will allow you to respond in different kind of cues as to what's happening in the presentation. So I will pass it back to Madison and we will introduce today's speaker. We're so excited to introduce a topic that is near and dear to many of our hearts. Our speaker today, Dr. Brian Shamblin, Assistant Research Scientist at the University of Georgia, will be discussing the DNA studies that allow us to look deeper into the nesting habits of threatened and endangered sea turtles. Dr. Shamblin has worked alongside GTM's Regional Administrator, Scott Eastman, and Coastal Training Program Coordinator, Caitlin Dietz, studying nest fidelity of sea turtles in Northeast Florida, including the beaches of GTM NERD. Today, Dr. Shamblin will be shedding light on how this program helps scientists gain a better understanding of sea turtle nesting populations, as well as other research projects in his career that have led up to this one. And before we get started, we would also like to add a huge thank you to the volunteers who dedicate their time to monitoring the sea turtle nests here in our region. Without you, this project would not be possible. And with that being said, I would like to introduce Dr. Brian Shamblin. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to, to be here. And I wanna reiterate all of that as well. I wanna end up talking about loggerheads in Northeastern Florida, but in order to do that, I have to zoom out a bit and talk about loggerhead nesting in the Southeastern US in general and about sea turtle monitoring really around the world. But again, we couldn't do projects like this without a pretty tremendous citizen science involvement. So my co-authors here, um, Scott, obviously is, is local, but they represent the sea turtle management authorities in states of Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, and North Carolina, as well as uh, my colleague here at the University of Georgia, who was previously my, uh, my PhD advisor. So this should be a fairly familiar scene to most of you, if you're interested in, in sea turtles. This is really the best opportunity that we have to understand how sea turtle populations are doing around the world. It's the nesting females represent the most accessible life history stage. And so the easiest way for us to understand how many females are out there is to go out every morning and, and count nests. Of course, sometimes that can be a little scary. So these are Florida index nesting beach data going back from the late eighties up through the mid two thousands. And so 15, 20 years ago, you're, you're sitting here watching these nest counts go down, down, down every year. And you really don't know what to anticipate moving forward. And so one of the struggles with having just the nest count data is trying to understand what it means for how many females are actually out there. Because we know that these females are typically laying more than one clutch of eggs. So when we see fewer nests, does it really mean that there are fewer females out there laying? Or could it just be that they're not getting enough food? And so each female is laying fewer clutches of eggs. And then when we think about these trends over multiple years, you can ask the same question about their remigration interval, that number of years that the females skip between nesting seasons. We rarely see them nest back to back years. It takes a lot of energy to lay and yoke those, you know, 
up to eight clutches in a season. And so typically these females are skipping one or two years. So again, it's, um, it could be that maybe we don't have fewer females, but maybe they're having to skip longer to come back to nest. And so these are really critically important data that you all collect, but we need to kind of take it to the next step to really fully understand what's going on and what's underlying these, these trends. And traditionally we would collect those sorts of data through flipper tagging. So really going back all the way to the 1930s, there were projects that were trying to apply tags to these females when they come up to nest. The challenge here is being able to intercept all the females on a particular beach, because if they come up at high tide, they can come in, they can body pit, they can dig an egg chamber, lay, camouflage, and be out of there within an hour. And so if you're trying to monitor these beaches at night, you basically have to cover the entire beach at least every hour. And for a lot of our undeveloped barrier islands, particularly up here in Georgia and, and in South Carolina, there are stretches of beach that look like this, where you have erosion into the maritime forest. You can tell that during a big chunk of the tidal cycle, this is impassable. So you're not going to be able to use a vehicle to get to all the available nesting habitats. And so no matter how hard you try, no matter how efficient you try to be, you're never going to catch all the females on a particular beach. They're just impossible. The bigger challenge for us in the southeastern US is that we know females are using multiple beaches to lay. And so Tony Tucker, when he was at Moat Marine Lab, he put satellite transmitters on females to get at this idea of, of clutch frequency. And what you're seeing here in, in black are the number of nests that were recorded for females from the tagging, from just the flipper tagging project itself, from the patrol. The white bars represent the actual clutch frequency for those females based on the, the uh, satellite telemetry. So not surprisingly, from the perspective of any single beach, you're missing a lot of the nesting for a lot of these females because they're moving around and they're nesting on multiple, multiple nesting beaches. So this obviously is a great way, if your only question is how many, how many clutches of eggs are they laying within a season, telemetry is a really good way to get at that. The problem is the transmitters tend to be a little bit heavy because of the batteries. They tend to foul. And um, also we've learned for some of the females that actually do carry the transmitter all the way from the nesting beach to their foraging area and then back to the nesting beach again, during the mating process, the antenna often gets sheared off. And so these, these things fail to transmit even if the batteries are still good. And so you can use telemetry to get it at clutch frequency, but these longer term questions of remigration interval and annual survival, we need a different way to get at that because we can't get long term data from the uh, telemetry alone. And that's sort of where the, uh, the genetic tagging project comes in. Back during my master's research, I was trying to figure out what the limits were in terms of getting usable DNA out of pretty much every kind of sample you could think of. So strandings, dead hatchlings, depredated eggshells. The one thing that I never dreamed of touching was a viable egg. Um, but in this particular case, we were working with the Little Cumberland Island program in Georgia, and they were still out at night tagging at that point. One of the technicians took, uh, they were taking biopsy samples from these females and also inserting these, these metal flipper tags and they happened upon a nest that they actually hadn't gotten to yet that was completely depredated by raccoons. So the female had come in and nested and left before they were able to catch her. So they didn't know who had, had laid those eggs, but the technician had the foresight to free some of those depredated eggshells. And she asked, you know, hey, can you tell if this is one of the turtles that we've tagged based on our, our skin samples? And I didn't hold a lot of hope out for it because in the literature, there really wasn't much at that point about it. It was a little bit with alligators and, and some, some bird species. But um, I messed around with it for a few weeks in the lab and we finally sent it over to our core facility. And sure enough, it worked. We were able to get maternal DNA from these eggshells and it did match one of their known nesting females. So the light bulb sort of went off about the kinds of questions that we could address using this sort of technique. 
Um, what we do, I don't want to really get too much into the, the weeds on methodology, but we, we use a freshly laid eggshell. So typically they're collected the morning after they're laid. And unfortunately that means unless there's already a broken egg there, based on the female crushing it or a, a ghost crab depredation, that means we actually sacrifice an egg from each clutch. And that was the difficult thing to get over for me personally. You know, obviously we're working with the conservation dependent species, so I don't really like the idea of it. Um, we tried other methods. We tried inventory samples. And unfortunately, I don't really want to get into too much detail, although I'm sure I can probably spend some time talking about this later. Um, there are limitations, basically, to using those nest contents that are left over after the hatchlings have come out. And so this was the, the only way we could get the really good quality DNA that we needed to match our, our females. So what you're looking at here is a fingerprint that represents 16 microsatellite loci for a particular female turtle. So the orange peaks are the size standard. They're what we use to figure out how big the pieces of DNA are that we are copying. And the colored peaks, the black, the blue, the red, and the green represent the actual data for this female. So these are exactly the same kind of markers that we use in human forensics to you know, match a crime scene sample to a suspect. Except in this case, what we're doing is once we know who a female is, we are matching her nests to her. And in the event that we see new DNA from a nest, what we do is we wait until we catch a second clutch of eggs that matches that first clutch to assign then a new female, uh, a, this fingerprint to a new female. And we started this project the pilot study was in 2006. We started doing this statewide in Georgia in 2008. And then ultimately we're able to do it for what we call the Northern Recovery Unit, which is the subpopulation that's nesting north of Florida in 2010. And that goes all the way up to Virginia and then Maryland actually gets a nest, you know, a nest or two here or there. So looking at what we've assigned so far, we have uh, been able to assign about 90,000 nests to a little over 12,500 unique uh, female loggerheads. So it's kind of nice to take a step back. I know you all have the same issue when you're out there and there's just so much you know, blood, sweat, and tears on the beach and you're, you're doing the same thing every day over and over again. We do the same thing in the lab and it gets to be a little bit of drudgery, but then when you kind of hit the pause button and say, okay, look at, look at what we've been able to, to accomplish here, it's, it's kind of nice. So what, we're, what we found really with these Northern Recovery Unit females is very similar to what uh, Dr. Tucker found with those females that were nesting on Casey Key. These are data from two of our physical tagging beaches in Georgia. So they're out there all night looking for these females. And you notice that the most common pattern is that you see if most of these females only lay one clutch of eggs. But in reality, that's because they're nesting on multiple beaches or they're nesting in those areas where you can't get to them during high tide. And so we get a very different picture of how many clutches of eggs these females are laying when we get a little bit more of a complete picture regionally. So we tend to see these females lay roughly four to five clutches of eggs per, per year, but there's a lot of individual variation. And what we found overall is there's a lot of variation in many of the things that we're interested in looking at. I saw something pop up there about eggshells. So in this particular case, one of the, the ways that we looked at that was to divide the study area up into these latitudinal bins. We know that loggerhead turtles can use the Earth's magnetic field to navigate. So they're homing to natal regions based on these magnetic cues. And latitude actually lines up fairly well with some of these, these magnetic cues along the eastern U.S. coast. And so in this particular case, um, we were interested in if we assign females to one of these bins. So down here at the bottom, just uh, bin one here runs from the Florida border up to the, uh, the north end of uh, what I'm looking at there, maybe St. Simon's Island. What we noticed is down here, 20% of the females that we detected nesting there, we only detected laying a single clutch of eggs. What's interesting is that 
as you move a little bit northward, that, that proportion goes down. And so that probably makes sense because of an edge effect. You know, those females that are nesting on the Florida border, we're probably catching some outlier nests by those females that are mostly nesting further south. What's really interesting though, is if you keep going further north, this pattern continues. And so the further north into North Carolina we get, the higher the proportion of females we detect laying just a single clutch. And we can't um, really attribute this to nesting uh, detection efforts. So in North Carolina, they're out there every day looking pretty much at every single beach the same way we would be in Florida and in Georgia. And so this higher proportion of females that are only laying one clutch of eggs, we can't really uh, attribute that to an effort situation with the survey effort. What's also interesting is that site fidelity of these females is variable across this region as well. So this is a really busy figure, but what is happening here along the x-axis is these are those bends starting in Florida over here at the Florida border on the left and then moving northward as you go right. And what we have on the y-axis here is what we're calling beach extent or nesting extent. It's basically the distance between the southernmost and northernmost clutch of eggs for any particular female. And so on average, what we're seeing over most of Georgia and South Carolina here is that females on average are spreading their nests out over maybe 15 or 20 kilometers. And then all of a sudden it's like flipping a switch here as you get into Northern South Carolina and into North Carolina. You see it goes sort of bonkers. These females are spreading their eggs out over much larger areas and there, you see a lot more variability there as well. And so these represent data for 6,000 individual females where we detected them laying at least two clutches of eggs. So some of these nesting histories may be incomplete, but this is the best we have based on, you know, the large area that we're looking at. What's really concerning, or at least it was to us early in the project, is so many of these females are not coming back. And so even though I told you, you know, we've identified a huge number of individual females over time, a large proportion of those females from the early years of the project we've never seen return. And so at the project scale north of Florida, roughly a third of all the females that we detected in 2010, 11, and 12, up till now, we have not seen those females return. And again, if we look at that spatially in terms of how it breaks down over the whole study area, we see that the further north we go, the more females we're missing. So it doesn't really make sense, right? If, if these females were just nesting across the border in Florida, we would expect that the number would be much higher down here than it actually is on the other end of the spectrum. And there's really no loggerhead nesting up here. You know, we've, it kind of uh, comes to an end in Maryland. And so with all these things that we're seeing, there's this big question about, you know, what are we missing here? Um, are all these things that we're seeing real or are they an artifact of the fact that some of these females could be nesting somewhere else? And of course, the big question is, could they be nesting in Florida? Because that's the next closest place they could be. And green turtles actually made me think of this as well. I don't know if you all know, but there's actually a decent amount of green turtle nesting in North Carolina. I mean, nothing compared to Florida, but regularly we see a few dozen nests, maybe 50, 60 nests a year, in North Carolina, whereas in South Carolina and Georgia, it's extremely rare to see green turtle nesting. And so that's another thing that made me think, maybe these females are actually in Florida. So that brings us back to the question of accounting for everything that we need to with these, these types of survey data. So this is an updated picture of the index nesting beach data from Florida. And so you see that, that dip that ended up bottoming out here in 2007, and then things start looking better again. You see the nest numbers are going back up again, but then more recently we have this little dip that trails off at the end. So beyond also needing that individual female data, the other thing that we have to account for is the site fidelity 
of those females. And so we know that Florida is not one big mixed nesting population. There's actually some structure there. And it turns out when you account for some of the genetic subunits, you see that the patterns actually can look a little different. And so these are much smaller nesting populations over in the Gulf Coast here. This is the Sarasota area on top and then down uh, at Key Waden, uh, southwestern Florida on the bottom. And you see that overall the, the trends are actually going up at the tail end of these, these nesting series. And so it's really important that we account for this, that we understand how these different subpopulations of turtles fit together. And this is what that looks like genetically. So this is a different kind of DNA that we use to look at this. This is mitochondrial DNA that is passed down from the mother to her offspring. So it's much like if you think of our surnames, how we typically handle our surnames in the West, you know, we pass down the, the father's name to the offspring. In this case, it's, it's like that, but with the mothers instead. So regardless of whether you're male or female, you've inherited your mother's mitochondrial DNA. And so you can think of most of the loggerheads nesting in the southeastern U.S. as having, as belonging to one of these two really common maternal families, these CCA1s in blue and CCA2s in yellow. And if you zoom sort of all the way out, you can see that in the far north, all we have are these A1s in blue. And in the far south, they're completely absent down here in Mexico. So everything in the middle is somewhere in between. But if you kind of zoom in again, you can tell that this, this change overall doesn't look gradual. So here at Canaveral National Seashore and, and down at Melbourne Beach, even though there's, you know, there's maybe 75, 100 kilometers separation here of beach, these two pie charts look very similar to one another. And similarly, if we go down to southeastern Florida here, this is Juneau Beach in northern Palm Beach County and Fort Lauderdale down in Broward County. These two look very similar to one another, but then very different from what's happening up here in central Florida. So how we interpret this is that females that are hatching in this general area of central eastern Florida are going to return there to nest when they reach sexual maturity. And the same thing down here for southeastern Florida. So it's very important that we understand how that works so that we can make sure that we're adequately protecting these distinct nesting populations. One way to think of it is, um, you know, in central eastern Florida, there's a lot of really great protected nesting habitat. We have Canaveral National Seashore, Canaveral Air Force Station, Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge, and Archie Carr National Wildlife Refuge. And that's great for those turtles that are nesting there, but that's not really doing anything for these females down here because they represent basically a completely separate group of females. And so the big question is, where do the northeastern Florida loggerheads fit into this overall picture? And this is some older work that goes back um, to 2011, where we, we had samples from Amelia Island and from St. John's County in general, Flagler County in general. And what you see is that those little wedges of yellow are getting a little bigger each time you, you take a step down in terms of counties. And if we look here at the inset map, we're also seeing some interesting things through time. So this is Volusia County. And these are samples here that were collected by Beth Livert's group in the 90s. These are some samples that she collected in the mid 2000s. And so we see that there are temporal differences. These things don't even look the same through time. And even among this later sample from 2006 to 2008, there are actually differences between years. So I should back up and explain that most of these samples are not coming directly from nesting females. They're coming from nests that have hatched where we've been able to, to salvage dead hatchlings. In this case, because we're using only mitochondrial DNA, the hatchling actually looks exactly the same as its mother. And so we can use the dead hatchlings or the hatched eggshells for this question. The problem is we don't know who laid these nests. So in order to use these data without replicating multiple nests by the same female, we have to limit our sample to a 10-day a window, basically, so that there's not a chance that that female has laid a second clutch of eggs in here. And that really limits our ability to look at how these things change through time. 
because we don't know what's driving these, these time differences here. And so that brings us to our second question, which is how do these things change over time? And, and ultimately, how do these, where do these Northeastern Florida loggerheads fit into this larger picture of loggerhead nesting in the Northwest Atlantic? And so those are both critical questions that we felt like we could answer with this eggshell tagging technique. And I really blew through that super fast. So this might be a good time for me to hit the pause button and ask if there are some things I can, can clarify before I get any further. So we did have a question from Sid, um, Cindy in the chat box. And it was if after an egg hatches, already like a successful hatching, um, are you not able to use the DNA to match it then? That's a good question. Um, what happens with the DNA, so that fingerprint that I showed is, is actually the mother's DNA. So we're not getting any of the any hatchling material at that point. That DNA that's that's there, we think is trapped within the eggshell. It's probably trapped in calcium layers on the egg itself. And so that DNA is essentially it's dead, basically. It's DNA that's shearing into smaller and smaller pieces throughout the incubation period. And so the DNA that's left on a hatched eggshell really won't have any of mom left on it anymore. It's gonna represent that hatchling that came out of that egg. So the challenge there is we need a lot more markers to confidently assign a dead hat or you know a hatched eggshell or a dead hatchling from nest A as a sibling or a half sibling from a dead hatchling or a hatched eggshell from nest B. And even if we could do that, the challenge is we have males mating with multiple females, we have females mating with multiple males, we have multiple paternity within clutches. And so even if we could say nest A and nest B are, are siblings, they, they look, look like they're related as brother and sister or half brother and half sister, we don't know for sure that mom is actually the shared parent. It could be dad that's shared. So if we're trying to assign these nests to particular females, which is important to get at those questions of clutch frequency and, and remigration interval, then the only way to get that is to actually have mom's DNA. And unfortunately that DNA is degrades throughout the incubation period. So even if we have an unhatched eggshell at the end that doesn't have any you know, embryonic DNA in it, mom's DNA is usually in such bad shape at that point that we can't use it to assign the nest. Are there any other questions? Um, feel free to type them or verbally ask them at this time. I think we can safely have a little verbal Q&A too, if anybody else has anything to ask. Or you can type it in the chat box too. I think everybody's waiting to hear more about their turtles. Mm -hmm. Yep. So I guess we're good to continue on then. All right. So this is where you all come in. Um, and again, I want to reiterate the huge thank you because this is entirely a volunteer effort. And these are all of the projects in blue that have agreed to sample for this, for this uh, project. So we have two state parks who decided not to participate in sampling due to concerns about uh, personnel. Everybody else that monitors these beaches is collecting samples for the project. And I really appreciate that time and effort, uh, particularly last year with all the, you know, the extra steps that you all had to go through dealing with, with COVID protocols. And how I've divided things up here is a, it's a little artificial, but I've done this with these bars just to show you uh, kind of similar to what I did with the Northern Recovery Unit. I'm going to talk a little bit about the that mitochondrial DNA and what it looks like in each of these areas. And so what we ultimately did was based on a female's um, overall center of her nesting effort, we assigned her to one of these boxes, even though that's a little bit artificial because they often nested across multiple boxes. 
So this is really typical of, of what we see for a lot of, of females. This particular female was first detected in 2016, laying three clutches. She came back, remigrated in 2019. We detected her laying five clutches. And then she actually did the odd thing that we don't see very often and came back the next year in, in 2020 and laid four more clutches. And so really this is fairly common for what we're seeing in Northeastern Florida in that most of these females are new to the genetics database. They're not females that had previously nested north of Florida that have come, that have come down. But there are some, and this is an example of one of those females. This particular female started out nesting on Cumberland uh, Island here, just over the border, but then moved up to Hilton Head. So that's, that's about a 150 kilometer shift in her nesting in 2012. When she came back in 2015, she actually um, laid three clutches on Cumberland. But then when she remigrated most recently in, in 2017, all of those were down in Northeastern Florida, uh, Jacksonville down south of there. So this is one of those missing females, but overall, this is a really rare pattern. And so this is just a snapshot of what some of those females look like from the 2017 season. The N there represents the number of unique females that we detected in each of those, those areas. And then I'm gonna show you the exchange not surprisingly, Amelia had a lot of females that also nested across the border on Cumberland in Georgia. And so that represents the most exchange that we saw across the, the Georgia, Florida border. But really we saw it all the way down, all the way down to the Flagler County line. There were some females that also nested in Georgia in, in 2017. And that holds true as well for South Carolina and even North Carolina. So, it's a small number of females that we're detecting doing it, but there is some connectivity across really large spatial extents. We have some females that are nesting, they're, they're spreading their nests out within a season over four, five, 600 kilometers of beach. And this is another a pattern that's again, sort of typical of what we're seeing for these females in Northeastern Florida. So her history actually goes all the way back to 2008 on Cumberland but we only detected laying, her laying two clutches that year. And so we likely missed additional nests in Florida. And she came back in 2011, but noticed that she has a, she has a 27 day gap in her nesting history here on Cumberland. So again, I think it's really likely that was a Florida, a Florida nest. When she returned in, in 2017, she started nesting down here in, in St. Johns County, but then also her last clutch that we detected was back up on Cumberland Island. And then finally, um, last year, we see several Florida nests, but we still have a gap here. Um, we're almost done with the first pass of, of nests from last year. So hopefully we'll get all of your, your reanalysis done before we actually have a new samples from this year. So now we really have to zoom out to pick up some of these females. Uh, this is a fairly rare behavior, but we certainly are seeing it in multiple females. And the first time I saw it, I honestly, I didn't believe it. So this female, we detected her initially nesting up at Cape Hatteras in North Carolina in mid June. And then 19 days later, she's nesting in your neck of the woods. So the first time again, I saw this, I, I didn't think it was real. I thought we had, had a, a little labeling issue in the lab, mix some samples up. But um, I did a little research and turtles are certainly capable of doing this when they're in migration mode. They're capable of swimming this fast. And actually this isn't, um, this isn't new. The first time this was detected was actually back in the seventies. So Doc Earhart published a note about this where a female that had nested up at Cape Lookout in North Carolina was uh, captured by the UCF crew 19 days later nesting at Cape Canaveral in Florida. So this is entirely consistent with what has been seen previously. And what's interesting is it's, it's not just one direction. So here's going the other direction, a female that init initially nested again there, all the way up to Cape Lookout. 
took her 20 days to make that that swim up there. Here's a female that started out in Florida, went to Cape Lookout, and then actually came back to the Jack's Beach area. So it's taking these females a fairly long time to do this. Typical internesting interval is 12, 14 days, maybe as often as even eight or nine days rarely. So this is a really long time. It's, it's obviously taking a tremendous amount of, of time for these females to make it that far. And, you know, my big question is why are they doing it? I mean, I understand that it's good to not put all of your eggs in one basket, so to speak. But it seems like this is a lot of effort and energy going into spreading them out quite this much. But maybe they just like to travel. So this female, uh, we just published a note on this turtle. I, we just submitted it back in December thinking it was it was really cool. It was sort of a 40 year revisit to that note that, that Dr. Earhart had published. And so we think that this turtle swam a minimum of 1,370 kilometers between these three, these three nests. And no sooner than I had submitted this, than I was trying to clean up some data and I found a turtle that, that breaks this record even. So this particular female started up almost on the Virginia border in late May, came all the way down to Volano. So again, it took her 21 days to do that. And that's a long way too, because she obviously had to go all around, all the way around Cape Hatteras. So this was almost a thousand kilometers there. And then she ended up going back up to North Carolina to Fort Fisher in, in the Cape Fear region. So we think she swam a minimum of almost 1500 kilometers to, to be able to do that. So this is obviously um, not something that most of the females are doing, but it's a pattern that clearly multiple females are doing. And I wonder how much more of this is actually happening than what we've been able to detect because we have so many of those North Carolina females that we only see lay one clutch and then there, there's such a high proportion of them that go missing. I've got to believe if we could get further south in Florida, like that Cape Canaveral turtle that they, they wrote about, that there may be a lot more of this back and forth happening even than we, than we previously thought. Um, so, so I wanted to end on some, some of what makes the genetic tagging different than a, a typical physical tagging project. In a lot of ways, the data that we're collecting are very similar. So we're not actually seeing the female, but we're identifying her as an individual. The cool thing about the genetic data is we can take it a step further and we can actually look at relatedness among these females. And we have to be careful about it because the number of markers that we're using, um, we can have a little bit of error rate there. So we're not gonna confuse a, an unrelated pair of females with say sisters but we could confuse the actual category of relationships among females. So what I'm talking about here are mothers and potential daughters. But in some cases, these may be siblings rather than you know mother and daughter. For the purposes of what I'm gonna talk about here, it doesn't really matter because I'm more interested in where they're nesting relative to one another, not so much time. So in this case, if we're wrong about the category, it's not a big deal because at least we're talking about maternal family lines and where these relatives are nesting relative to one another. So I talked about the, the mitochondrial DNA in terms of trying to use it to figure out subpopulations, right? How connected are these turtles nesting in different areas? Unfortunately, you saw when we get into the Northern Recovery Unit, virtually all the females look the same. And so we can't use that mitochondrial DNA to get at that question. In a perfect world, what we would do is we would sample hatchlings. And then we would sample those turtles when they come back as nesting females. They're doing that with leatherbacks at Sandy Point in the U.S. Virgin Islands. And so when you do that and the female comes back, then you know exactly how old that turtle is. And you can get at some really interesting information. For us, obviously on this scale, there's no way we could, you know, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of hatchlings making it to the water. So there's no way we could, we could do that. But the next best thing we can do is say, hey, where is, if we do have these potential mothers and daughters, where are they nesting relative to one another now? And so in cases where we have generational overlap, where are daughters nesting relative to where mom is nesting? 
So in this case, the mom is, is where the star is there on Cumberland Island, and she has six females that we can't exclude as potential daughters. And that turtle was last detected in 2009. And so we think that was it for her. That was the end of her, her reproductive life, if not her, her overall life. We don't know if sea turtles live on after they, they finish nesting, if they basically have a sort of reproductive senescence, kind of menopause, or if they nest right up until they die. We don't really know. But either way, the last time we saw this particular female was in 2009. This is where three of her potential daughters are nesting relative to her. And so we have one right there on the same island on Cumberland and two to the next island uh, to the south and for Amelia. And then we see three more a little bit further south. And so all the way down to, to Crescent Beach here, we have potential daughters for this particular female. And so you see, it, it looks like at least these turtles aren't necessarily going back to a specific beach but they're coming back to a general area. And it may be a, you know, a 75 or 100 kilometer span of, of beaches. And in our area, that makes sense because there's a lot of good nesting habitat spread out over a really large area. And if they're shooting for a particular area and they miss, then there's a good chance they're still probably gonna find some decent nesting habitat there. And so overall, we don't think selection pressure is very strong for these females to have really tight site fidelity. It probably makes sense from, from an evolutionary perspective for them to spread their, their nests out over larger areas. And then here's one I found. Here's a mom um, with four potential daughters. And again, we have two that are really close here in the, uh, the southern end of, of St. John's County. But then we have sort of the opposite pattern. We have a potential daughter up on Amelia and a potential daughter up on Cumberland Island. So a similar spread in where these turtles are nesting relative to one another. So if we revisit this question of where do the Northeastern Florida turtles fit into this bigger picture, these are the data that we have so far. Uh, we have a long way to go to catch up here with 2019 and, and 2020 data. But you notice uh, with the exception of the um, little Talbot turtles there, what we seem to be seeing is a bigger chunk of yellow with every step to the south. It's almost this gradual change from north to south. So between the combination of the individual data that we have and now these, these mitochondrial DNA data, what, what it looks like we're seeing here is a really broad transition zone. The turtles nesting in northeastern Florida probably represent a big transition zone between what we're calling the northern recovery unit north of Florida and these central eastern Florida turtles that are down in Volusia and in Brevard County. And again, the, the interesting thing is most of the females that we're seeing that are nesting both in Florida and north of Florida are doing it within seasons. So we're not really accounting for a lot of those females that have gone missing up north. It's just that we're missing part of their nesting history within a year because they're they're kind of bouncing on either side of the, uh, the Florida Georgia border. And again, what we're seeing in northeastern Florida, these turtles look like they represent a really broad transition zone. So, from a management perspective, and from Florida's perspective anyway, you basically are representing your own subpopulation. So, if it means that when we're analyzing the nesting data, we need to to consider those northeastern Florida turtles separate from anything that's happening further south in, in Belusia and in Brevard County. We have a lot of questions left to tackle. Many of you collected yolks in addition to the eggshell that we use for genetics, and those will be used for stable isotope analyses. And we're, we're partway through all those analyses now. The idea is not only do we want to know who these females are, and you know, how many clutches of eggs they're laying, how they're spreading them out over space and time, but also where are they foraging? Are these females going up to New Jersey and Chesapeake Bay? Are they hanging out in the local area? Are they going down south to the Bahamas? And so we'll, able, we'll be able to address that question with the, the yolks and then the goal is to put all of these data together for, for analyses. The thing that I'm excited to do next with those mitochondrial DNA data is actually to test for 
variation through time. So if these females are coming from different foraging areas, it may be that they're showing up at different times both based on where they're coming from. And with our sampling that we used to do in those little 10 day windows that represented peak nesting, we'd never be able to test for that. Well, now we have data for the whole nesting season. And we now know who these mothers are. So this is something we can test for across the nesting season as well as from year to year. And the thing that this has allowed us to do is, you know, we gave up early on on running the mitochondrial DNA from those turtles nesting north of Florida because basically every single female we looked at was the same. They were those A1 turtles in blue. So we weren't learning anything by sequencing those. What's interesting about a lot of those females I showed you today that are actually moving between Florida and North Carolina, they're not those A1 turtles in blue. They are actually A2 turtles in yellow or they're rare haplotypes that are coming potentially from South Florida or even Cuba or Mexico. And so now that we know that this pattern is, is real, we want to go into those Virginia and Northern North Carolina uh, for those nesting females and actually sequence that mitochondrial DNA for them. Because with all the differences we're seeing for those, those turtles, it may be that even they don't really represent what we're calling the NRU. We may be seeing the beginning of yet another new subpopulation up there. And that's all I have, and I'm sorry I ran through it so quickly, but I'll be happy to spend time answering questions. Yeah, so Dr. Shamblin, um, I'm sorry I didn't catch your attention earlier, but um, we did have a question from Stan in the chat box, and he was wondering if the nesting lifetime of a female, um, the duration of that, what is the nesting life? That is, yeah, that's a great question. The record that we know of um, is a turtle that I almost put in this talk, but I was afraid I was going to run too long. Um, she's a female that got tagged on Jekyll Island, and anytime Jekyll tags a turtle, they name her. And so her name is Big Bertha. I actually encountered her before they tagged her back in 2006 during my, my thesis work. And Jekyll, before the Georgia Sea Turtle Center was there, tagged in the 90s. And so I wasn't really too surprised to find a tagged female. So I recorded the tag. I didn't really think too much of it. And we got some data back on, on her. Well, some of the old Georgia data actually aren't in Archie Carr database. They're so old. So ultimately what we found out was that turtle was initially tagged in 1980 on Cumberland, which is the year I was born. Um, and she nested up in, through 2016. So she nested for at least 36 years. Um, unfortunately, a lot of those females, the only way we would know how long they can nest, you know, is they were tagged a long time ago. Well, a lot of those females were knocked out, unfortunately, because they were taken out by shrimp trawlers before TEDs were implemented. And so we don't really have a great feel uh, for that. Larissa Avens has also done a lot of work with aging of, of based on bones of stranded turtles and she has found that some may be able to nest for up to 40 years so we think that may be a, a real thing if they can avoid all the predators and you know all of the the bad stuff they may be able to nest for at least at least 40 years awesome that's a that was a great question stan and then also he had a second question and that was how long before a hatchling begins nesting? That's another great question that we, we can only sort of guess at, unfortunately. But we, again, and this is based on a lot of work uh, by Larissa Avens, and there's a lot of individual vari variability in it too. It depends on where the turtles end up foraging as oceanic juveniles. So how good is the food and how much of it is there? But then also where do they end up foraging when they come back? So our turtles in the Northwest Atlantic are leaving the coast and they're ending up off the coast of Africa before they come back. It can take them, you know, maybe eight, 10, 12 years for that first part of their, their life cycle. And it could probably take anywhere from 10 to 15 years for that second part when they, once they've returned. So 
we think these nesting females are probably at least 25 to 30 years old when they start nesting. Awesome. So um, I think we have time for about one more question um, that can be verbal or chat box. And then um, after that, we can get into today's poll. Uh, if it's anonymous, so um, for anybody who, um, you know, isn't, uh, it's anonymous. <laughs> and aside from that, I don't want to leave behind anybody who has questions for Dr. Shamblin. So this is the last chance here. Um, so with that, um, thank you so much. This was a very informative presentation and we're happy to be conducting research alongside you and everyone in collaboration. Um, it doesn't seem like anybody else has any other questions. Scott says it was a great presentation. Yes. Thank you. It thank was you great. all again for allowing me to, to speak and for participating in the project because without the samples, we can't answer any of these questions. Yes, again, thank you to the volunteers who dedicate so much time to helping monitor these nests and, and to take care of them and keep them safe. Um, so if, um, if you don't mind sticking around, um, I will announce some upcoming events as well as launch the poll here. Um, so it helps us with, uh, let us know what kind of outreach we're conducting. Um, so feel free, it's just a couple questions. It was great to see everybody here. We had a pretty great turnout today. Um, while everyone fills that out, I will announce some upcoming events. Um, so we do have our guided exploration hike um, on site at the GTM trailhead. And that is now happening um, at 10 a.m. every second Wednesday until the end of May. So I have the dates listed here. The next one is April 28th. Um, we also reintroduced the marine land hikes. And so far we have the River to Sea Preserve Trail Walk. Um, I do know a lot of you are tuning in from St. Augustine and Palm Coast. So that is over near the GTM field office, if you're familiar with the area. Um, and if not, you can find out further details at the link below, which is gtmner.org slash events. Um, and I will also include it in the chat box so you can just click it too. Uh, we also have a few more uh, lectures coming up within our series. So next month for May, we'll have Barbara Blonder and she is from Flagler College. And that will be at the same time as today's at 3 p.m. And then the following month in June on the 21st, we'll have Mike Sullivan, who's from the Commander's Shellfish Camp too. And um, with that, I see we've had some responses with the poll. So thank you part for participating in that. And aside from that, um, I'll pass it back to Madison so she can conclude today's um, lecture. And thank you again, Dr. Shamblin. That was a very informative presentation. All right, so we have a couple more um, comments coming in from the chat box. Lots of praise, Dr. Shamblin. Um, people are very excited to see where the egg collection data is going, people that are involved with this project. Um, and I think a lot of people learned a lot of new stuff today. So very good feedback. And we really appreciate your partnership. So with that, um, I don't see any more questions. If you guys do think of anything else um, you would like to ask us or Dr. Shamblin, feel free to email us. Um, we did have our emails linked to the signups here and um, you can always find us at gtmner.org and if you have any more questions we will relay those to Dr. Shamblin. And thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you everyone.